So I'm Naomi Heiser and I work in the MAP library. I want to introduce Melanie Yazzie, who's the head of printmaking. Well, you all know because you're in her class, but for the other people who aren't in the class, she's the head of printmaking and professor of art and art history here at CU. Um, she has a beautiful art series, very moving pieces there, all sort of down the stairwell, which are, you're welcome to go look at after this is finished, um, called Heart Mapping. Um, which is part of, a, of an exhibit that also includes maps from our collection that have to do with Native American lands. And then um, she brought a visiting artist, Faith, how do you say her last name? Miss McManus. McManus from New Zealand. And she's an art teacher at North Tech Education Institute in Northland, New Zealand. And they're going to have a conversation about indigenous artists and land representation in art. I'm thinking that's what you were going to do. <laughs> okay. And I just want to thank some of my colleagues here for their help. Eileen Rains, who's out there somewhere, and Dave Carr, thank you so much for helping with the exhibit. Um, and Donna Hamilton and Dresha Shadden, who helped set up the reception, is very helpful. Thank you. And Andrew Violet and um, Deirdre Keating for all the publicity for this, which has been really wonderful. So uh, there's one other thing I want to mention, that there's a, another professor who was involved in this who's also at CU. Her name is Sarah Krakow, and she's a professor of law and her specialty is Native American land law and she wrote an essay for this exhibit and we have copies of it on the table so that you can read it at your leisure. Please take one with you. It's sort of a longish essay. You might not want to read it during the exhibit. Um, so welcome everybody to um, our presentation. Um, I wanted to begin by thanking all the indigenous people that come from this region and to thank them for um, letting us be here with our university and with our community. Um, I think oftentimes as people in this country, we forget the people who um, had originated from this location. And so that's what this um, exhibit that I um, put together wanted to focus on. Um, the pieces are in the stairwell and they are um, gouache and watercolors about how the land has been partitioned up across the United States and often I'm flying from one location to another and I look out the plane and see all the farmland broken up and it always um, occurs to me again that when I'm traveling to each place I'm visiting indigenous nations, leaders and people and, and we talk about land and how land is important to us and how when we speak about home, it's not so much just about a portion of land, but about cultures, song, food, um, the smell of a place, and all of that encompasses home. And so when, when we think about um, land, it's, it's all of those things together combined. Um, we're very fortunate to have uh, Faith McKenna here with us from New Zealand. She has arrived this Wednesday and she's going to be working w uh, in my class with my students for the next um, couple of weeks. And um, Faith, if you could introduce yourself and then I beg you to share what you would like about uh, would like to share about issues of land. Okay. Um, uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, my name is Faith McManus. Oh, sorry, speak up. <laughs> um, gosh, where do I start? Uh, I suppose I introduced myself to the students earlier today in, in an English version of the formal way you would introduce yourself in Māori. And one of the things that you do is you talk about the place that you're from. You will identify the waka that your ancestors came to your country. You identify the, the landmarks that you see around you. So you will identify the maunga, the mountains, the awa, the river, and that situates you as an indigenous person and it tells the other people who you are and where you come from. And, and it just, uh, it's just how it's done. <laughs> um, so I come um, from the very tip of New Zealand, which is, in my opinion, the most special place. Um, and that is, um, the north is actually where the area um, which was first colonised. 
it was the area where the Treaty of Waitangi was signed, and that is the founding document for the nation of, of New Zealand. Um, so um, maybe as we, t I can talk maybe a little bit about that later. So f in terms of um, the, the idea about Māori relationship to the land is, is one that's similar to many other um, cultures, is that the earth is the mother, so the earth is Papa Tuanuku, and she is our mother. Um, Ranginui is the sky father, and he's our father. And in the original mythology, they were in close embrace, and their children um, were born somehow in between them, but there wasn't enough room for them, and they couldn't get on with the things that they wanted to do. So the children talked among themselves, and some wanted to push the parents apart. And um, some were against that, but eventually what happened was uh, Tane Mohuta, the god of the forests, um, they, they, were, they were various attempts, but they did push them apart. And from that, you, what happened was, um, in Māori terms, is called um, Te Ao Marama, or this world of light. And so that's our world that we live in, which is a world of, of the world of light. And so we could all move around and do things, etc. Um, so that's kind of the, the base thing for um, relationship with land, is that the land is um, our mother. And in Māori, the word for land is whenua. That word also is the word for the placenta. So one of the um, very old customs is that the afterbirth of the child is returned to the place that you come from and buried by a special tree. <coughs> so it's just some of the things um, that are springing to my mind as I'm sitting here without any plan. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I suppose those are some, just a couple of things that I thought about. Um, and um, I suppose one of the important concepts is um, the concept of kaitiaki tanga, which is guardianship or taking care. So um, for Māori, the, the idea of taking care of the land and ensuring that it's healthy and can be passed on to future generations. And I guess that's a, you know, that's a, a, a very much a shared thing. What is really important to me about this conversation that has begun um, is when we started coming to look at the maps in the library here, I think one of the first questions was looking at some copper plates, some etchings that were done of maps. And eventually, I think we're going to begin with the library to print those copper plates in our print shop in the art department. And as we started to look at the copper plates, it was interesting because they had had other people look at these plates and say it would be very difficult to, to do this. And of course, a printmaker, I came in and looked at the plates. I'm like, oh my God, we could do that, no problem. Thank you. Yeah. And, um, and then I started speaking to them about uh, the work I do, the maps, and how I always incorporate maps into the work I make to speak about land base and where I come from, and how mapping um, is so much more than just going from one place to another, but there, that there are stories within maps. And a lot of the work I make um, also is a map of my internal history, my personal history with um, fighting uh, or coping with and living with um, being a type two diabetic. And so a lot of the works that I've been making recently are documenting sort of the flow of, of things I'm taking in and it going through my body. And so rivers um, simulate the, the digestive system. Um, and, and again, the body represents land. And so in caring, uh, caring for the land, we're caring for ourselves. Um, and that's what I keep educating people about. A lot of times in the work I'm making, I'm working with numbers, and a lot of the numbers that show up in 
um, the prints that I'm making, um, they're <coughs> documenting the, my blood sugar counts. Um, every morning when I wake up, I write the numbers down and I'll incorporate them into the work. And it's really interesting when I talk with people about the numbers and they hear through um, an artist presentation about this, there are other people who are living with this. And, and doctors and nurses who've seen um, the work, they look at the work and they say, oh my gosh, that was a good, a good start what happened here and we have this whole other conversation about the numbers and the time of day that that the numbers are recorded and and then again when you talk about land um, there's numbers that are incorporated in that to let you know where you're at so um, within the work that I do I'm always trying to connect it back to my history my people's history and when we talk about um, diabetes and different diseases that are in native communities, um, they come from this new way of life that we've come into and a breaking with what's happened in the past. And so it touches on that part of our history. Um, and I think when um, we started talking about this map project, I said, you know what, it's really amazing that um, Faith is going to be here when this happens. And um, there's a possibility of another artist, uh, P.K. Clark from uh, Hawaii, who may be coming sometime in the coming year. And we've got other indigenous artists that are um, close by and in this um, part of the Southwest. I said, you know, what if we put together a project that can encompass all these indigenous artists that are speaking about land and home? And um, the library said, yes, we should explore that. So I sent out a call to um, 15 other indigenous artists, some in New Zealand, some in Hawaii, some across the United States, and the responses came back, yes, we want to be in this project. So um, Faith has come and she's brought some plates um, that she's gonna use to make her um, map piece for this um, project that we're beginning. And some of the artists, hopefully, um, we've been in conversations with the library that maybe we can put a symposium together um, for maybe next summer to have uh, some of these indigenous artists come to the library and um, do something similar to what we're doing today. So um, part of the recording of this is documenting this history because I think so often throughout um, the travels and things I've done over the years, when I first started working as an indigenous artist, people would say, we should record this. And I'd always be like, nah. It's a, but you know, now it's 25 years. And, and it's interesting when I look back on the people I've met and Faith and I were visiting the other day in class and talking about um, people excuse me, people like Manos Nathan, who um, was a huge leader in the Maori um, ceramicist movement and Colleen Ehrlich and how they've recently passed. Um, other people like uh, Sandy Adset, who is a well-known um, painter and June Grant. And um, I've been fortunate enough to come into contact with some of the most amazing people and the recordings of these moments um, are far and few. And, and that's why I said, you know, it's, it's small, it's for my <coughs> class and for the Boulder community, but, um, and the library said, yes, we would like to record this. And so um, this, this is what this is. So my hope is that in this, that maybe a conversation can happen. There might be other questions that could be recorded because um, as time goes on, when these other native artists come or indigenous artists come, we may be able to record those, those interactions. And, and then maybe at some point, there'll be a student who's working on these issues that who might listen to the recording and then make journeys to these places to see these artists, see what these things are about, and then begin to help document the history. I think too often with um, indigenous people and any people, um, there's somebody else who's writing our history and deciding what it is that's important. And I've been sort of ranting over the years, not just as an indigenous person, but as any person, my students, it's important for you to be able to tell your own story and write that story. Um, too often I've had 
art historians or other people write about my work and who I am, and then I read what they've written, and it's their theory of what they believe my work is about. And I read it, and then I have to call them up and say, this is wrong, this is wrong, this isn't right. Oh, that's a nice way to see it, but that's not it. And, um, so it was really wonderful that there was a law student who put this essay together, who looked at the 1990 Indian Arts and Crafts Law, who looked at the history of our people, who put all those things together, and then looked at the artwork that I was making and that Greg Deal, who I'm collaborating with at the Denver Art Museum, all the history behind his work and that essay that is here for, for people, you should read that. Um, it's a beautiful written summary of, of, of a section of, of what I do and the passions that I have about making my work. Um, so all of that encompasses what uh, this exhibit is embarking on. It's just starting this path of, of making connections. Um, Faith, can you? Yes, sure. Uh, um, I w just want to um, support what um, Melanie was saying to students about being able um, to communicate. I, um, I did do a little homework when um, Melanie emailed me um, about Faith, we're going to talk about land. Um, and I thought, oh, OK. Um, so I have a. Um, um, I took some notes because I rang up my brother because I'm very fond of my brother and he's very wise, but he's also worked a lot on, um, he's trained as a lawyer and worked a lot on land issues and he worked as a negotiator um, for our tribal group um, with, the gov um, with the government to um, have land returned to the iwi. So um, he um, said to me, something which is something I do all the time anyway. He said, you can only talk from the pattern of your personal experience. And I thought, yeah, right, that kind of sums it up, really. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think um, one of the um, things that I, I talked about earlier with, um, with the students was the idea of um, whakapapa or genealogy. And so in Māori terms, everyone's genealogy goes back to the whenua or to the land. And there's the idea very much that it's not that you own land, it's that the land owns us. Um, so um, in the, um, when you look at maps of New Zealand, um, there are distinct maps that show um, tribal areas. And um, in terms of working with the government and the Department of Conservation and various things, there is now a process where um, there's always consultation with iwi, with tribal groups. It's just part of law in New Zealand. Um, and I must say I feel quite proud about that when I think about it. It wasn't always like that. I mean, it's really really, really, um, it's not perfect, but things have really um, improved and um, over the years, but it's still going on. The whole business of some um, tribes have negotiated with the government, and some of those negotiations have gone on for 20 or 30 years until the right people have come into place to really be able to um, finalise them. And then what's happened is, um, the, a lot of the land was taken very illegally, and um, and so um, there's been a process of um, reparation where lands have been returned to iwi um, and financial reparations have been made. But it's not taking land off individual people to return it, it's been taking the land from crown areas. Um, and so that's been... Um, that's been a big thing. It means that tribes can have um, some uh, financial uh, ability to look after themselves again. And some um, settled quite a long time ago, and they're doing very, very well. Um, the Māori economy is worth billions of dollars in New Zealand, and um, people are doing all sorts of things 
with that. So that is a kind of on a uh, on a I suppose a practical level, but on the kind of uh, deeper level, mana whenua or the 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 power of your connection with that land or your um, your kind of right to talk for that land, that's got nothing to do with ownership. That's more to do with history, and um, your the fact that you know your people settled there and lived there, and your the stories all come from over those centuries. Um, <coughs> lots of um, oh, just I just have to pause for a sec. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things that comes with that looking after the land, and that's an important part of um, uh, Māori concepts, is the idea of manaakitanga. So that's your ability to um, look after people when they come to visit you. Now, if you haven't got any land or any, if you haven't got access to any ocean to catch fish or to gather seafood or to grow gardens, you haven't actually got the resources to Manaki, so you haven't got the resources to uh, feed 500 people who have come to visit you because someone important has died. So there's all these kind of layerings that go on with the, the practical level, you know, the spiritual level. Um, I felt a little cross with my brother because he, he, he said something which I wasn't sure whether I entirely agreed with, and he said, you know, if you don't know those things, if you don't know, you know, the story from your area and your marae and your stuff, then um, you are spiritually disenfranchised. And I was like, and then he said, like such and such, and he was talking about another couple of our cousins. And I thought, oh no, that's too harsh, you know. <laughs> and, uh, um, but I think um, the the sense of belonging to a place, I have lots of friends who've moved around the world and and they don't feel like they belong anywhere. Um, but I know where I belong, like there's that connection to a place that's so strong, it's like, you know, little red strings go down through my body and into that land. And as soon as I get to a certain place up north, um, which is kind of north of Whangarei, I'm just home. And because I've got lots of connections in various tribal things, like from this certain, it's about sort of 200 miles is like home, you know? And I can stop in here and see this cousin and I'm connected to that marae. Um, You know, there's another place, that's where, you know, my such and such came from. And I just feel like that is home. Um, so even when I live somewhere else and I talk about, you know, we've bought a house in another city, and we lived in the South Island, and I'd say, oh, we're going home. And I always meant home was in the north. And even when I'd finished visiting, then we're going home to Dunedin. So I was kind of like, that's home, but this is really home. Yeah. Um, one of the things I really enjoy about um, presentations or gatherings like this is I, I really would like to hear questions or comments from people who've come, because I think um, in, in the coming to something like this, there may be a question that somebody has, and I find that as an Indigenous person, um, when people are coming to things, um, it's a point where uh, your questions can be answered when, when we're here. And I always invite people that are welcoming and open um, and will do educate people in a, in a good, um, full way. So. Um, I'd like to ask if there are, if anybody has a question. Uh, I was just wondering, you guys talked a lot about uh, meeting with other people, um, especially indigenous people, so I was wondering what your most meaningful interaction was with someone, or like most memorable interaction with someone. I don't think I can measure <laughs> a memorable, this. You can repeat the question oh, sorry, for the recording. Oh, sorry, you asked if, uh, that you, we were talking about, um, Indigenous gatherings, and you asked if there was a most memorable um, interaction. Honestly, I can't measure them. There's so many of them, you know. And one of the um, the cool things about being an Indigenous artist is, and a printmaker is you have a double network. You have your Indigenous network and you have your your printmaking network, and sometimes they come together. Um, and uh, yeah, I I just can't 
I can't think of um, a most special one. Um, there was a very, the first one, um, Melanie just mentioned two people before, Manos Nathan and Colleen Ehrlich, and they invited me to go to a um, cultural exchange in um, Queensland in Australia with a, a, a group of artists from the north. And um, um, that, was, that was very, very um, memorable um, for me. It was, I felt really lucky because I was brought up by my grandparents, so like I like hanging out with older people, so I got to stay in the house with the older people, and so that was pretty memorable. And I, I, um, um, I think that, I mean, all Indigenous people have stories that are, you know, are sad stories about land things, but I am um, hearing the stories of the, um, the Aboriginal people in Queensland, they, they, call, they call themselves the Māori, Māori, like very close to Māori, yeah? And their stories were just, I, I mean, I just, when they were sharing stories, I just stand there and I just like tears poured out of my face. I couldn't believe, you know, how horrible some of the things were. Um, on a lighter, a lighter note about that, I think one of the things that was really memorable there was actually people's sense of humour, you know, the sharing through humour and the ability to just laugh and laugh about stuff. Well, if you didn't laugh, you'd maybe cry, you know. Um, and the joke, playing jokes. Yeah. Um, I think one of, uh, there's been, like Faith has, says, all our indigenous interactions are really powerful. Um, but since Faith is here and talking about that connection with Aotearoa, the island of the long white cloud, um, I was first invited to Aotearoa in 1995. And at the time I was working at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, and um, there was a poster around campus that said, you know, if you wanna go to this gathering, send your slides, images of your work, and fill out this form. And so I was teaching there and I saw this poster and um, got my images together and filled out the application and sent it off in the mail. And then like a month or two later, I got this letter that invited me to this gathering in New Zealand. And they said, your accommodations will be taken care of. You'll be at the Aupomona Marae um, with all these other artists. We'll provide art materials and everything for you, food, lodging. Um, you just have to get to Aotearoa. So then I started to do the fundraising and get the money to go, because I think at the time the tickets were about 2,400 round trip. And this was in 1995. And um, I somehow got the money together and went there. And this is kind of, I mean, there's, there's really some powerful things that happened, but I was just thinking of something f funny. Um, I got to the airport in uh, Auckland and Marie Laws, which is a um, American artist from Alaska, was part of the group picking us up. And <laughs> she said, oh, so you're Navajo? And I said, yes. And she said, I hope you get to, I hope you stay for the whole thing. And I said, uh, why is that? And she said, well, we had a weavers gathering a couple of years ago and some Navajo women came and they talked about where we're gonna all sleep. And we told them that you're all sleeping together, men and women in the Marae, um, which is the meeting house on mattresses on the floor. And um, somehow they just, they didn't, agree with that and so they left and um, in my way with our people the Diné um, we're very private and men and women don't mix at times and um, people who don't know each other you don't all sleep in the same place anyhow I guess they were very traditional so they decided that that wasn't for them and they were going home well, it took so long for me to get there, and I went through so much that I just said, I don't care, I'm staying here. And she said, well, you know, everybody shares everything here, and we all eat together, we sleep together. It's like, I said, I'm ready for it. So we get to El Pomona Marae, and everything is 
listed in Maori. And um, I woke up in the morning and <laughs> I was like walking to go brush my teeth and shower up. And um, I saw the back of people going into one washroom and I marched in there and there were a bunch of men in there. And I said, good morning, Kira. Started brushing my teeth and they were just like, good morning. And I'm like, you know, getting ready. I thought, well, I'll take a shower later. <laughs> <laughs> just get cleaned up. So <laughs> brush my teeth, wash my face. And then I went over to the kitchen and all the women in the kitchen were watching me. And I was like, hello. <laughs> and then I said, why were you in the men's bathroom? <laughs> and I said, I, there's no symbol for men or women, and Marie Laws told me that we all have to share. And <laughs> I said, so I just figured I'll shower later, but. <laughs> and all the women said, Wahine is woman, Tane is men. So there are two bathrooms. <laughs> But of course, after that, everybody heard, like, watch out for that one. <laughs> and the same happened with the sleeping arrangement. Like, I was very exhausted that morning. And again, um, the time change and trying to figure out the bathrooms. But that night, like, I went in and everyone was laughing at me at breakfast. And um, the story was going around and then... Um, they said, you seem very tired. I said, I'm exhausted. And they said, well, you know, we noticed you were sleeping by the Samoans. And I said, oh, uh, yeah. They, uh, they said, they snore really loud. I said, I know. I could feel it vibrating. <laughs> and, um, and they said, well, why didn't you just move? And I said, because Marie Law said, like, we're sharing everything. And they told me to pick a mattress and stay there. And I said, um, so I'm staying there. And they, they said, well, did you notice a lot of us just moved to the other end of the meeting house? And some people moved outside. And they said, we all wondered. She's the only one who's staying there. <laughs> don't. Yeah, I was just like, I'm not leaving. This is, I'm, I'll sleep in between things. But, <laughs> but it was crazy. Um, when you're on the marae, you can sleep in different places. And um, there's, you know, you can, it's a really friendly environment, but it was really funny how all these things happened. Um, but I got to meet like amazing artists and we had a wonderful time. And um, if you're ever invited to, to be on the marae and do a project with uh, their people, go, it's, it's amazing. But take earplugs, everyone does. Yes, yeah, <laughs> earplugs, um, I think. There were so many funny things that happened there. So thank you for your question. That's <laughs> Tani is man, Wahine is woman. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> um, is there another question? I do actually have a question. Um, mm -hmm. Earlier, uh, when you were talking about the So the question, um, the question that's been asked is um, when at, we've been speaking about when we become indigenous artists and when that turning point took place. I think in a sense, maybe when we're talking about it, in my case, um, I speak about when I have become an indigenous artist. I think I've always had have been an indigenous artist, that's just part of who I am. I think one of the times where it really dawned on me was when I actually was in graduate school here at CU Boulder, and we were in a, a symposium class with, um, a seminar class with Lucy Lepard, who wrote the book Mixed Blessings. Um, if you're not familiar with it, look it up in the library. It's one of the first multicultural books that um, focused on uh, people of all colors and their work. And she um, edited and put put that book together. Um, and she taught here in the early 90s and it has gone on to write books about land and, um, and lives in New Mexico now. But we were in this class and we started the class and she asked us to speak about place and home and we went around the room. And I remember people saying, 
I don't belong anywhere. I have no culture. And, um, or I'm a woman, and so my place is being a woman. And, um, and I remember it came to myself and Laura Shirley were both Diné women. And there were a lot of like feminist women in the class. And, um, and they said, you know, how do you feel about this? And I remember um, we just said, well, we know where home is. Home is our land. And as women, we, we come from a matrilineal society and I've never felt below anybody else. And um, so it was really foreign. And because we were raised at home around Navajo people, we weren't the minority. So as I grew up, I never, we never felt like the minority until, like, in a sense, we left home. Then we started to understand what that meant. And so um, that, that class, when we spoke about identity and who we were in place, I really started to think about who I was at, because of the answers. And I just thought as we went around the class and peop some people were upset because they were, they said, you know, home, I don't know. I don't, I, my family has lived everywhere. I don't know my history and people were breaking down. And I just remember really being shocked because uh, I just thought that everybody had a sense of home and place and witnessing that I, I felt really bad, but at the same time, I was really proud, and I just thought, this is cool. I've gone through school, and it's the whole story I tell my graduate students all the time, because in grad school, everyone's trying to find their way, and I always tell them, it's like uh, the Wizard of Oz. You already have the ruby slippers on. They're there. You just don't know it. You have to go through this long journey, and then you look down. So I always tell my grad students, look at your ruby slippers. Your answers are all right there. They're all here, and you just need to, to have confidence in it. So for me, that's, that's when it started. And then I started to understand a lot more about history and become confident about it. That was great. That, um, that's great. When you said that, it reminded me of, um, you know, art school and turning points. Um, as I said earlier, I come from the very far north, from the tail of the fish, and um, I went to art school in Dunedin, which is in the bottom of the South Island. And I decided to go there because I was one of those people who had been to Europe but hadn't been to the South Island, so I chose Dunedin, which is as far away as you could get from home. And um, when you live, the place that I come from, is a, a really big Māori population, and lots of intermarriage, and lots of intermarriage with um, Croatians, because um, people came from the Dalmatian coast to dig gum at the turn of a century. So I'm part Croatian, part Irish, part Māori, part English. And um, so when I lived at home, everyone knew my family. That, you know, like I explained, you know, you, you say you're Pepiha and this is who I am and these are my ancestors and my Maung and my river, etc. When I went to Dunedin, I don't look obviously Māori and um, so I was in art theory class, which I really loved. And one day we were having some conversation and then it, appeared, it seemed to me that the discussion got a little weird and the discussion was occurring as though there was no one Māori in class. And I was really uncomfortable with some of the comments. So I'm sitting there going, how do I feel about this? This is uncomfortable. What am I going to say? And that was a real um, kind of turning point for me because it was because I'd gone away from home, I had to sort of start explaining myself, defining myself, um, just talking about my stories. Whereas before I was home, it was just home. So that, you know, a, that was a moment that um, was kind of a big moment for me at art school when I sort of went, well, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very comfortable with that remark. I'm Māori. And um, I have to say that um, I, before I went to art school, I actually st did um, studied a year of a management degree. And I had lots of... Um, mates who were guys who were doing the management degree and one of their friends came from South Africa and he said to me, this is a really racist country and we were having this kind of intense conversation that you have as first year students about, 
everything and 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 then those uh, sort of comments about Māori and I said look I'm Māori and they said you're different and I said why because you're at university that was it <laughs> I was like yeah so um those things I mean education's great I love it you know it just it makes you think and um I'm really grateful I'm really grateful for those those uncomfortable times that you have as students I think they're really important you know if as long as you can kind of um be empowered by them rather than um you know leaving mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah Is there another question? Yes. Just, it's very interesting to hear you talk about this turning. Um, could you also talk about relations with other indigenous people, maybe in moments where you felt your connection and also your distinction? Oh my that's gosh, a good one. that's, a, that, great that's a really great question. That immediately um, brought me back to, again, when I was here at CU Boulder, this was in the early 1990s, um, there was a, another Navajo student here and I remember he was very much about land and protesting everything and um, and he was very much in every all of our faces about speaking your language and knowing your history and knowing all of these things that are native and, and um, I don't know I remember calling somebody home back on the reservation and saying oh my god like I feel like I was just attacked by this other Navajo guy and he was like like telling me I wasn't Navajo and because I was wearing a watch and <laughs> and that because I came to class on time that I wasn't Navajo and um and it really disturbed me it was really funny I just felt terrible and um so I called this good friend of mine at home and I said, this is really hard being here because I just thought I would finally was going to be with other native person and, and then I f sort of got put down and I said, I, I'm, I, don't, I don't know if I should be here. And um, my friend <laughs> back at home said, well, what was he wearing? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, what was he wearing? And I said, um, jeans and a t-shirt and tennis shoes and he said well that's not traditional if he was in a loincloth there <laughs> and, and he's saying all this you know um, he said then then maybe he needs to think about that too and but it was interesting that interaction helped me realize that um, that the my approach to learning and educating is a different approach in that um, I started uh, I had a lot of work that was very much about history and in your face and over the time period I realized that in making that work that was and I and I love people who can do that work I appreciate the artists that do that work um, but I realized that that heavy uh, weight of carrying that anger um, that it, when I'd show those work like the people who loved it would stay and be like yeah those my people are horrible <laughs> and this is bad and um, so I was just with the group of people who understood where I was coming from and the history of our people and then uh, but I realized that people who really needed to hear it some like um, I had a professor who was very racist and very inappropriate and he would just never listen or see the work and just turn away and walk away and I would see the person leave different things and I just thought that's who I need to reach that one so I thought how can I do that I'm going to make work that is in a, in a sense um, kind generous almost playful and and then I trick them into coming in so 
they come in, they were like, oh, you're such a happy little Navajo, and <laughs> things are happy colors, and <laughs> we want to support you. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, and then we, I hear where they're coming from, and then they say, well, you know, you speak, your English is good, or this, and you're not like the other natives. And, um, and then I say, well, actually, I am like them. And um, I was sent away to a boarding school. My dad and mom were sent to a boarding school, and we learned this and that. And they were like, wow, I had no idea that we did that to you. And I say, yeah, that happened. And so when I was there, I learned about art, and this happened. And then so then slowly they began to understand where I'm coming from, and it, it was a good way. But it was because of that interaction with that, with that young uh, Navajo man um, that that happened. Um, there were other times when um, I worked on a project with two other Navajo students and it was cute because we're all Navajo and um, one of the young men he said I want us to do this installation together and it's going to be really great we're going to educate everybody and I was like okay that'd be great so we started working on this piece called Three Little Indians and it turned out that Victor Masaiva, who's a really well-known uh, Hopi filmmaker, was in town and he needed props for this movie he was working on. He saw in the paper that our installation was in the art building, so he came to um, get some of the images uh, for the film. And um, he met us, and so we got connected with Victor Masaiva and his work got to meet Ava Hamilton, who is a Boulder filmmaker, an amazing uh, Rapaha woman. Um, and it opened that realm. So the artwork opened lots of doors, and then it connected us with, with each other as indigenous people. And But it was interesting. Um, Ken, uh, Ken Yazzie, Laura Shirley, and I, we all were Navajo, but we all had different experiences. I grew up on the Navajo Reservation. Laura grew up in a border town, and then Ken grew up in Farmington um, uh, with a different background. So each of us had a different experience to being, being Navajo. And in working on that collaborative piece together, we learned a lot about each other. And one of the amazing things that happened was Ken was in an anthropology class and Ken was at the time an undergrad and Laura and I were graduate students and he said we're gonna go speak to the anthropology class about being Navajo and we were like yeah let's go so um, we go and the anthropology class has like 300 people in this big auditorium and there were three chairs up front and Ken had organized it all so we we're I remember I was walking in there I got up on the stage and all the students were coming in and Ken's like, where's Laura? And I said, I don't know, she'll, she'll be here soon. So um, the microphone is set up in front of the, the class and the teacher says, oh, I've got this paper here to introduce each of you. And um, he, Ken says, okay, I can do that. And he reads the paper and he stands up there and he says, my name is Ken Yazi and I'm here with my two assistants. Laura was walking down um, to the front <laughs> of the stage and she was so quiet and wonderful. She was coming down and I remember as soon as he said that, she like just turned around and started walking out. <laughs> and I'm up there and I'm like, oh my God. And I was sitting in a chair because he's over here. And I ran over to the microphone. I said, excuse me, I'm sorry, Ken, I have to interrupt. And he was like, why? And I said, I need to tell everybody in here that um, we're a matrilineal society, and Laura and I are graduate students here. We're not Ken's assistants, and um, we love Ken dearly, but we're our own women, and we are in our own place, and um, we're, Laura was just coming down the path, and she's just starting to leave, <laughs> and she turned around, and she was just laughing, and I said, so Laura, please don't leave, and she, so she came back down and, and came and sat with us, and um, and then we had this presentation about who we were and this project we were working on. Uh, but it was funny because that was a project we all worked on. And even though it's, it's that whole thing of you come from the same community and you may think you all think the same, but it really is each person's experience and, and then how that experience morphed into other things for us. So, but there's many things like that in each of the places I've been at, but it's, it's always amazing to work with um, like-minded people and people from our communities and, and things that we can do as um, indigenous people together is really nice. And I think what's amazing right now at CU Boulder is that there is a center for um, 
Native American and Indigenous Studies on campus and that we're having more um, Indigenous professors here um, in a state that is known for cleansing itself of Indigenous people. Um, that's one of the things when people say, why aren't you teaching on your nation with your people and why aren't you doing this or that? And I say, well, I'm, I'm in a state that worked hard to cleanse it of any color and for me to be there is really important to, to share that. And, um, and then when we're able to bring in more indigenous people um, as professors to this program, I think it's, it's amazing. So having been in that place as a student here where there weren't many, I mean, um, but there were pretty powerful people there here at the time. I'm Vine Deloria, Vine Deloria is here. Um, Linda Hogan had taught here amazing people in the community. So unknowingly, um, it was a great place to come. And now it's, there's even more people coming here. So it's really great. Thank, um, thank you for your question. Um, Faith? Yeah, I, it makes me think of lots of things actually. So um, I started talking about going to Queensland um, with a group that Manos and Colleen had organised. So as part of the getting together of that group, some of us knew each other really well, but some of us had never met. And um, Māori have tikanga or customs that kind of bind you together. So um, one of our group uh, produced a little booklet of songs because part of you know traditional things is um, it's important to sing after someone speaks and um, so when you go as a group you look really tight you know you look like you've known each other from birth it's amazing and um, but in fact it's all just come together at the motel at the airport the night before <laughs> and, so um, one of the things about um, Polynesian Māori culture is there are certain things about um, generosity that are very important, and so things about giving gifts is um, part of cultural um, making connections. And so, before you've you know organised yourself to go, everyone's got a little got some packages of gifts that they've got together so that they can give to the other artists or the other organisers, the cooks, whoever, um, on the other end. So um, we went um, to um, Brisbane, then Bundaberg, and then we went. Um, we were welcomed on by um, a group a group of people, but they were. The artists in that group were from really, really quite far away from each other. It's a, a big state. And um, a, two or three of them knew each other, but they'd kind of been pulled together um, for this project. And it was the first time that I'd worked in that situation. So we went to a big station that, um, that was land that had been returned to their um, tribe or group. Um, and it was really amazing the differences. Actually, there were lots of things that were the same, but I was really quite um, struck by the differences. And one of the things was to do with language. So um, there are sort of dialect differences in um, New Zealand in speaking Māori, but in um, the Aboriginal culture in Australia, there are very distinct languages. And some of the people in this group of artists, they're um, their tribes had actually been hunted and killed and there were only a very few of them left and they'd lost their language. It meant that they hadn't learnt their language and therefore they were voiceless. They couldn't just use another Aboriginal language. They, uh, from then on, they could only speak in English. That was, that was really mind-blowing to me. It was really, um, really quite very sad and um, very devastating. Um, and another thing was about um, their, their, their um, they were, you know, we were talking about privacy, you know, so they were, men and women had separate houses, so when we stayed there, the young men were in one house, the young woman in, the, uh, in another house, and the older generation, we were in the big house. Um, <laughs> and um, so, and we were allowed to be in the same house together. Um, but 
one of the things I, um, uh, about Māori, Māori really likes sharing. And so the, um, the, some of the things around the, um, the Māori culture was that the, they're very strict about intellectual property. Like to, to steal or use someone's imagery traditionally was punishable by death. You know, so that if I went and used, if I saw Melanie's designs and I took them and used them in my work, you know, that that stealing of intellectual property was, um, uh, it was, yeah, punishable by death. So that I hadn't known that, and um, my friend Bindi told me about that. The, and what I, they felt, it was quite interesting, they, they openly shared that they felt all over the place compared to us. They just looked at us and said, God, you guys are amazing, your culture's so strong, and blah, 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 you know, and you're, look at you, you're fantastic. And we're like, we're a mess. And I, we were like, no, you guys are great, you know. Um, honestly, we just, you know, we, it looks like this, that we all known each other from birth, but you know, some of us only know each other for a little while, some for a long time. It's just a different structure. And so what I, really got from that, that our, um, the, some of those structures are very good for um, creating a tight group and um, that tightness helps with the con continuity and the strength of the culture and I think that's really important. So it, um, something I really um, have come to believe very strongly is that when you share something and you give it away, then you get it stronger and stronger. So I think that sometimes if you hide things and you and you just um, you don't, you know, you just want to, you know, and it's natural to want to hide things when you've been hurt and, and things have been um, taken away from you. But um, I don't think it's a good long-term policy. I think it it's better to um, share and that makes it stronger. Like, you know, when they discover um, plants on islands and they're endangered and they take them to nurseries and they grow them and those plants go into everyone's suburban garden, well, that that flourishes. I think it's a good metaphor. Yeah, so, so that was an interesting thing about differences. Mm -hmm. um, um, but the Probably there are there are more similarities than there are differences. I think I always find more similarities um, at those indigenous gatherings. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there another question? Yes. Um, Melody, I wonder if you would tell us a little bit about how it feels to be a in the museum. Oh my gosh. Well, um, if you haven't heard it, and maybe you have, um, you can. Google my name and the moth. Um, that pro uh, when I came here um, in 2006, I think a year or so after that, I was invited to help curate an exhibition um, at the Natural History Museum, and um, we went through all of the collection, looking at the different rugs to be put on display, and. I kept looking for my grandmother's rugs, like I was typing in the database, my grandma's name and both grandmothers, and nothing was coming up. So then I just thought, we'll just honor them by looking up the regions where our rugs come from. And so the other curator and I put um, four rotations of the rugs together. And in the fourth rotation, it was landscape. and. All year long, I'd been calling my parents to come see the exhibit, and um, they kept saying, you know, important things came up, they couldn't make it. So then the last rotation, I said, you have to come. This is part of our area that's going to be on display, and I want you to see it. So my parents came up, and um, I had put a series of my monotypes on exhibit also there. and when my parents came up, I told my mom, there's one of the rugs in the collection that really looks like grandma's rug, and um, I can't wait to see it. And Because we have one of the largest Navajo rug collections in the United States here at Sea of Boulder in the Natural History Museum. Uh, Joe Ben Wheat um, donated all these rugs, and 
it's amazing. Like any of you, it belongs to all of us. You can go there um, and look at them. Um, well, anyhow, we went to the exhibition and uh, we walked in and I remember um, saying to my mom, like right around the corner, there's the rug that looks like grandmother's rug. And she saw it and said, that is your grandmother's rug. And I said, how do you know? And she said, because I was carrying you when she was weaving that rug. Mm -hmm. We went up to the rug and it said, uh, Mrs. Tom Baldwin. My grandmother's name was Thelma Baldwin. So I'd been looking for Thelma Baldwin, but you know, in that time period, you were known by your husband's name. And I never thought to look up Mrs. Tom Baldwin, but that's how it was listed in the collection. And then under it, it, it said completed in 1966, which was the year I was born. And then we found other rugs by her and we're getting all emotional. And then I look off to the side and I see my father getting emotional looking down at this rug. And I said, Dad, are you okay? And he said, yeah, this is my mother's rug. And I said, well, is her name on it? And he said, no, it just says anonymous, but this is my mother's rug. And so we had, we talked with the museum people and they wrote down their names and got the stories. And, and I said to my parents, like, I always wondered about coming back here to see you, Boulder. Um, I had a very difficult time when I went through graduate school here. Um, it was hard. I, I think a lot of the time when I was going through school, because there weren't um, a lot of Native students or, or faculty, so many of the meetings I had speaking about my work was about educating my audience about what the work was about. And so at a certain point when I was here, I remember thinking, why am I here? Like, why am I in this place? I'm educating the people who are supposed to be educating me about who I am and where I'm coming from. And do I really belong here? And there were so many other crazy things that happened that when the university contacted me to come back to teach here, I just thought, Ooh, they got to make it a sweet deal. <laughs> um, so I came back and, and then I always had this question in my head, should I really be there? Should I be back at home? And when I put that exhibit together and found my grandmother's rugs, um, and I had just uh, was sort of at the point where I thought I should be looking for work closer to home. And when, those, when I found those rugs, it had been my dream to always have an exhibit with both of my grandmothers. So there I was with my work for the whole year up in the space. And then their work was in the museum. It just made this feeling of like, this is, this is, where, I, this is where I can be. This is OK. And, um, and then I went back to New Zealand and um, I contacted one of the Tamoko artists there. Uh, and I said, you know, I've been coming to New Zealand. It's been 17 years that I've been coming. And every time I come, I meet your Tamoko artists and they say, we can work on you when you're ready. And um, I said, well, you have to have a story or something meaningful and our people don't don't do any markings. and um, But when this happened here, uh, I went back and I contacted this young Maori man and said, I want you to do the work on me to honor both of my grandmothers. And it was interesting. He said, oh, well, I'd love to, but I don't work on non maoris And I said, I know, but you know, I, I think it's you. And I remember when I spoke to other people, they said, you could have Derek Lardelli work on you. You could have this person work on you. Like, they would do it in an instant. And these are the top, top Moko artists in New Zealand. And I said, I, I know I could, and I would love to have them work on me. I said, but I'm an educator and a teacher, and part of my work is passing the knowledge and acknowledging students. And uh, Richard Francis was a young man when I first met him in 1995 at the Opomona Marai gathering, um, and he was helping all of you put the gathering together and him and Johnny Poi hosted us in such a beautiful way and now he's doing Tamoko and and I, I want him to work on me and um, and and then I contacted him and he said he couldn't so I went there and I remember we um, 
went to uh, Rotorua, and I was staying with friends in Fakatani, Sue Pearson and Pekea Clark. And Pekea and Sue are going to be part of the mapping project um, that will be uh, added to this collection. Um, so I'm with them, and Sue, her people are from Norfolk Island, and the Norfolk Islanders are descendants of the people from the Mutiny on the Bounty, and they're Tahitian and English, and they now live on Norfolk Island, which they used to be on Pitcairn Island. Um, but I met her in 95, and she said, one day, Melanie, I want you to come to me, come with me to Tahiti, and I'm going to get my marks in. So 17 years ago, at that time, we had made this promise to each other that I would go with her to get her hers done. And then PK met Sue at that gathering, and he had um, fallen away from Hawaiian culture, but he had been invited to this gathering in 1995. And at that gathering, we were in Rotorua, and in Rotorua, there's a small island called Makoya Island. And there, that's an island where they train young men to be warriors. And during this gathering, we were all invited to the island, and I remember we were taken out on a boat, and this long, long waka came with all these young warriors to meet us, and we just saw them rowing out to us. And I remember standing by P.E.K. and we were watching these rowers, and P.E.K. says, you see the guy rowing there? Like, he's like one of the strongest ones, and he's amazing. And I said, yeah, that's right. I said, how do you know? And so he was talking about rowing and how he did that in Hawaii. And we got onto the island, and they, all these young men were making lunch for us and hosting us. and. They greeted us in, in the traditional way. And I, I remember, like this story is, I'm making it really short. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this man that P.K. had pointed out, um, we saw him and I noticed him looking at us and I said to P.K., do you, do you know him? And he said, he said, no, but uh, you know, um, I don't know why he's staring at us. So the presentation started, uh, stopped, and then this man came over, and he had a tayaha, which is one of their traditional um, spears, and he said to P.E.K., this is for you. And P.E.K. was like, oh, tell me the story of it. So he starts to tell him the story, and it turns out that this tayaha comes from a family that came from Hawaii which is their origin place. And Pika's family, his part of his ancestry was part um, someone who left and went away, and it was tied to that family. So that Tayaha came back to Pika and that connection. And so Pika eventually married Sue Pearson, and they have a family, and they now live in New Zealand. And so I went there to stay with them. And I said, you know, I'm going to go get my tamoko and <laughs> my moko done. And, um, but Richard said, no, but I've prayed for a, for a sign to see if I could do this. And um, Pia and Ken, they were all joking. They were like, well, we've always wanted one, but, you know, who are you? And I started laughing. I said, I don't know, but this is just what I'm supposed to do. So the next morning we woke up and P.E.K. said, do you know what happened last night? And I said, no. And he said, um, the, the volcano on the island out there hasn't erupted in over 100 years, and it just erupted. And I was like, my sign. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, oh, yeah, right. I'm like, no, really, I think it is. So we left from Fakatani, went to Rotorua. We get there to see Richard Francis. And I said to Richard, I prayed for the sign, and um, the volcano erupted, and I think that's it. And he looked at me, and he said, for us Tamoko artists, that's like a big sign because the earth is like your body when we make the mark and the lava comes up that's like your blood um so we i will work on you and he put his arm he said let me see he said it's going to be here and it's going to be here and so we put the images of the rugs from my grandmother's on my mom's side here my father's mother's there my him image of my husband there the um, sue pearson and her sea turtles there and they said it's there so it's always with you to keep you strong and that's all that's all part of this story and so i apologize when we go through these things when we're talking about land and history and place 
um, that the stories are long and very, very interconnected. And so when, you, when people ask me that question about my grandmother's rugs and, and the placement here in the museum, sometimes I just tell them, you know, just, just watch the moth story. But I think we're in a special place and I feel um, close with my students and proud of them. I spoke to them earlier this morning that this is one of the screen printing classes in Maymaster that has moved the quickest and has gotten the processes and the knowledge so quickly and that I was able to introduce some new concepts that I felt this is a group I can share this with and they're in the process of creating their images that are based on nature history and looking at things that are important to them. So I feel, I'm glad you asked the question and, and I thank everyone for hearing the answer. Um, so I got the work done and, and that, that brings us to this. And, and again, why it was really important to, to record some of these things because it's amazing when you start to hear some of these stories of indigenous people meeting each other um, it starts in small little ways and then it just grows and grows mm -hmm. into different things. And um, I remember when Manos Nathan and Colleen Ehrlich passed, I said to Faith, I never felt so far away from New Zealand. Like I just, I couldn't get there and I couldn't get there till a couple months later. And when I went, um, I was going to go see Faith's and her students, and but I had to see Manos and his family. And um, so we were able at another point to get to make the long trip to see Faith at the top of the island and um, have a meal with her. And she was in a place of just trying to gain the strength to make work. And others had told me, you should go see Faith. And I said, I'm going to, and they, and in New Zealand, driving, like, it's a long ways, and they are just like... And our roads aren't that great, <laughs> <laughs> especially up north. <laughs> yeah, and I just said, that we're going there. Mm. We're going all the way up to the top. We're going to see Faith and have lunch with her, and they were like, and? And I said, and then... We're going to go see Manos, uh, Alex Nathan and his family to pay respects, and then we're going to travel over here, and then we're going to go all the way from the top of the North Island down to the South Island to Wellington to see Maury Love and his people. Um, and, and that's what we do. I think that, as Indigenous people, that's something that's really incredible, is that when you have family connection or you respect somebody, you will just do what you can to like make it work for them. And, um, and in saying that, that's how I feel about a lot of my students is that I want them to make strong work about important things that are important to them. And then I want to try to support them and, and guide them and help them to get wherever they want to go. A lot of times some of them don't ever want to make art again. And I'm just like, that's fine. Like, where do you want to go? Do you want to go to business school? Do you want to go to, what do you want to do? Let's, how can I help you do that? That, that's my goal, and, and I think Faith is the same way with mm -hmm. her students, is we, I focus and look for artists like us and educators who do it for the young people, because it's such a cliche, <laughs> the hope is in the young people, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's amazing, so I think, again, that's why these uh, interactions in an education space um, and for students, um, it's really valuable to me. Mm -hmm. um, I look at all of you guys, and I, I'm very hopeful for the future. Um, I, my husband and I don't have children, and and it's funny in indigenous communities, children are like like they make who you are, and people always remind you of that. And I say to them, I. They always say, you don't have any children. I say, I have hundreds of children. <laughs> <laughs> and they're from all over the world, and they're doing important work, and, and I'm proud of that. And they say, but they're not from you. And I said, yes, they are. Mm -hmm. They're from me. They belong in my soul and my heart, and they're doing important work. And when they call on me or need me, I will help them. Yeah, so mm -hmm. do you have something to add, Faith? <sighs> If there was a question, I've completely forgotten what yeah, it was. No, okay. But I, um, 
I was just thinking about um, how wonderful it was to meet Melanie and how easy it was to make that connection, you know, and um, the last international indigenous gathering was held um, in the far north of New Zealand and Melanie couldn't get here because her students had had problems and um, I don't know was there flooding or snow or yeah, there was the some flood, big disaster. The flood happened. Yeah. The flood happened and I was booked and scheduled to go to New Zealand and mm. I had gone to help plan that gathering and that flood happened and students places were getting flooded and there was displacement and Mm. I just sent mm. an email and I said, I can't leave my students. Um, they don't know what I'm doing, but I can see that they're displaced and their places are flooded. They, some might be staying in the print shop. Um, there just needs to be a grounding place for them. Mm. And they said, well, sometimes we have to leave our students and sometimes we have to feed our souls and you have to come here to New Zealand because we need you and we want you to be with us. And I said, I know that, and I'm getting the strength from you all the time. I said, but these kids, they're coming from different places. Some of them are far away from home. Sometimes it's their first time away from home, and they're important to me. I'm going to stay here. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was a really beautiful gathering. It was really, I, it was really sad that Mel was <laughs> just rubbing it in. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, it was um, it was really good fun, and, and a lot of my students um, in the Marae, um it relies on a big team of volunteers to um, look after the cooking, look after the cleaning, etc. And um, my students were a big part of the team in that um, in that kitchen, and um, all volunteer they. They were told they'd be working 15 hour days, but they'd have a great time. And they, the ones who wanted to be there were, and it changed their lives. And they, you know, there was a whole catalogue from the exhibition with each artist and their work. And so everyone's got, I started the trend of getting everyone to sign each page and put all their contact details down. So all of my students ended up Facebook friends with all of these indigenous artists from around the world, you know, and so they made all those contacts and, you know, and they've been good at keeping in touch mm -hmm. and it's just opened up the world for them. It's like, it, it changed people's lives when they came back to school. Some of them had been perhaps not so connected to their culture and they came back and they were like, oh, I feel fantastic, you know, I'm going to make work about being Māori and blah, blah, blah. And, um, yeah, it was it was really um, really an amazing experience. So um, I think if you have opportunities to do those things, I know in Australia they actually have a program where people of any um, race can volunteer to work on Indigenous gatherings. And so you know mm -hmm. people who come from all over when we were in Oz who were manning the kitchen. There was the chef. We we'll always have chefs. It's great, and um, <laughs> the quality of food is fantastic, oh my gosh. and um, and that's a very important cultural thing. Um, so if you ever get the opportunity to you know volunteer or participate in anything, I think it's really worthwhile, even if it's a bit scary to start off with, you know, because um, you can you can be like you can be like you know 45, 50, and still get things wrong and feel embarrassed. Yeah, but you know it's worth it. You just get in there and, yeah, so. Is there, um, oh, super. Okay, go ahead. Can you, can you talk at all about how the work, um, your work and the work that comes out of your work, I guess, um, involve at all the climate change? It, the pieces are uh, gouache and watercolor pieces, and they're looking at uh, landscape and how our indigenous lands have been divided up and made into farmlands. And the, the pieces are meant to be a starting point for conversation on many different levels. So, so the answer would be yes, it, it is about that. It touches on that. And when I meet with people, we talk about a lot of different things. And um, we started... Uh, 
I don't know, maybe I'm odd, but we started right at three o'clock and, and then just went into it. So we've covered a lot of different things beginning with those drawings. And I think part of the work that I do is, um, is it's, it's abstract, it's open, um, and it's a place to begin conversations. So yes, would be the answer. Um, other questions or comments? Wonderful. Well, I think we can um, wrap this up and I um, want to thank again the native people of this region and area for letting us be on their land. And um, I want to thank everybody here at the library who's um, who have helped make this um, possible and have brought the wonderful food for everybody. Please, please stay and eat more food and, and talk with each other. Um, and my students will see you on Monday morning. Have a safe weekend. Don't work too hard. And, <laughs> and research your next project and do some writings on that. And um, you're to reflect on all of today's talkings and, and to write about it. I always require just one page, but there's nothing to say that you can make it into three or four pages or that it could turn into a grant application to apply for, <laughs> to, <laughs> to apply for funding to go travel overseas. I think I had a student once who was came to something and got so excited that then they wrote a grant and then got funds to go to India and do work and then from India they went to Thailand and Thailand they ended up over in New Zealand at a tree nursery working for three months. Um, so these types of things, uh, you don't have to be indigenous, you just have to be passionate about something that's important to you. And, and then just follow your heart. It, it's so funny to say that, but it's so true. If your heart is really into it, you, could, you can do it and find the people who will help you get there. Okay, have a good weekend.